thank you very much, Michael. And and really interesting that you know financial markets should be perhaps paying less attention at dissecting every line and every word of the the Fed policy announcements, but also looking more at you know the economic news that come out uh, in the days preceding the decision and what they imply for uh, the Fed decision uh, given the reaction function. So uh, we, I invite um, all attendees to uh, uh, put forward, you know, questions, and some of them are already coming up um, in the chat and uh, uh, through uh, to also the Q and A. So let me start with one uh, that I have here in front of me. So mo most of the results uh, shown in your paper seems to have been obtained by using a rather long sample, yeah, of basically 30 years of data. Is there important time variation in the results, uh, for example, in terms of monetary policy predictability? Uh, and do you see a difference between like pre and post uh, great financial crisis, pre and post great recession, uh, pre and post pandemic? And if you see those variations over time, uh, why is this so in your, in your opinion? Uh, well, we don't see any systematic evidence for variation over time, but that's, this is also very difficult to detect that because of, uh, you know, these announcements only coming once every six weeks, roughly, and uh, so we may just not see it because of a lack of power. Now, that's absolutely a crucial question. Is this still there? Is it driven by a particular period? We looked at this over a variety of different samples, including excluding the crisis, starting the sample later or ending it earlier. And we found very consistent results overall, um, but that doesn't rule out that the, the importance of these channels are, uh, is evolving over time. Thank you. Uh, so you don't find, I understand, like difference in the, also the, aggress the aggressiveness of the response of the central bank um, depending on the sample period, yeah? Well, I mean, that's another issue. Like, mm -hmm. um, no, the central bank has absolutely become more responsive over time. Um, that is, in our view, the most plausible explanation for why um, markets have underestimated the responsiveness. They're kind of learning about the policy rule and they're just, uh, they're just never catching up. Um, you know, the, the Fed has certainly been more uh, activists, uh, I might say, under uh, Bernanke than under Greenspan and, and has become more so with subsequent chairs. Um, and there's plenty of evidence, both in policymakers' remarks, but also in the data that, uh, that the reaction to you know, activity gaps in particular has become stronger over time. That's, uh, we think, a good explanation of our findings. Thank you. So picking up on uh, the questions, there's one around, you know, um, equity prices. Uh, and it says, uh, it still seems that equity prices often move in the same direction um, as, as, as rates, yeah. Um, in short term, short event windows around policy announcements, yeah. So why do equity markets not price in the macro surprises you use as your key control variable? And I must say, for me, it's also a puzzle that you know uh, financial markets that are supposed to integrate all this information apparently don't do so before the policy announcement. They incorporate a lot of information, but they're just unsure about how exactly how much interest rates are going to respond. Right? So stock markets go up in response to the news. You know, money market futures go up in response to good news. But there's just still a systematic hawker surprise, and in particular, dovish surprises on the downturn. Um, you know, that's just uh, um, pretty clear. Um, but, but this is about the stock market, the question here. So I think uh, maybe the question is referring to some of the evidence in Yaratsinsky and Karate's AJ Macro paper. So they find, um, I can't really, I kind of lost track of the chat and the QA, Q and A, all these questions, but, but you asked like, why is sometimes the stock market going in the same direction as the bond market around the announcement? Isn't that puzzling? Um, or oftentimes, right? And so I think there's very few announcements where there is a significant positive 
uh, movement in both markets. Most of these, where there's some puzzling co-movement, they're they're very either one of the um, responses is very small. And among the big movers, like there's also some where just measurement errors. Measurement error plays a role. Like this is one big March 2001 announcement uh, where there was a supposed information effect. But really, if you measure the monetary policy surprise uh, more comprehensively, you realize uh, why the market. You know, you see more clearly that the market, um, uh, you know, actually, you know, took on the monetary policy as surprise and that it makes sense for uh, the stock market to go down on that day. So I don't think overall the stock market evidence and the occasional uh, co-movement in the, you know, with the wrong sign is, is particularly puzzling. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I'll take, you know, perhaps two last questions. So one is, uh, and monetary policy surprises reveal changes in the judgment of policymakers to new information. Uh, not the information, uh, it is not the information that drives the expectations, but the new interpretation, yeah, uh, by policymakers of this information. So basically, you know, uh, basically the way the central bank reacts to new information. And and so how, the question is, uh, I think you addressed it, but maybe you can clarify that. I mean, how do you capture this in your analysis? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not so sure uh, what, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. I could just say that the monetary policy surprise can capture a policy shock or it can capture the difference between the judgment of policymakers and the market. Um, and it could also capture information effects, but but if if they are not there, right? So um, so the standard assumption is that you know everyone knows the policy rule and we kind of understand what the Fed is doing. So then monetary policy surprises would always be a really good proxy for or an instrument for monetary policy shocks. Um, but uh, if there is a wedge between how markets perceive the Fed will react to new data and how the Fed actually reacts to new data, then this wedge can also cause a monetary policy surprise. That's kind of the essence of the channel that we're talking about. Yeah, I think that was the question and, and also how you separate these two effects um, in, in your paper, yeah. Um, so closing with one uh, final question, um, I, so could we understand your Fed response to news channel just as part of the traditional pure monetary policy shock? Yeah, and thus separating these two has any practical advantage, uh, knowing that we can just control for news in lower frequency regressions? Um, right, yeah, so the the practical advantage is that we, um, well, so the implications I think are clear for both for monetary policy and for empirical work. Um, it's it's for both. It's it's important to know what um, whether there are any information effects. Okay, so now does it. Uh, matter whether we have a Fed response to new channel or traditional monetary policy shock? Yeah, I do think it matters. Uh, it's important to understand whether uh, the Fed is causing uh, financial market reactions uh, due to proper new information and a shock or because it just disagrees with the market because it has very different implications for monetary policy communication. And so I think beyond uh, the implications I spelled out here, um, this this is of uh, first order importance. Yeah. Well, thank you. Great question.